Got it. Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get this thing started. We do have quite a bit to cover uh, tonight, but welcome to Backyard Forestry. Um, I'm not Lori Jensen. I'm so sorry. I forgot to change the name on the screen and Lori would be doing a much better job, but you're stuck with me. My name's Andy Bennett. I am a director at the Forestry Association. So we are grateful you're here and we've got some good info for you. Just wanted to quickly run through a couple things. So tonight we've got Gene, oh boy, Epiphan. You got it. Am I close? Exactly. Correct. Hey, there we go. Okay. So she's going to be educating us on beech leaf disease. Um, and then we also have Don Donnelly, who's going to talk a little bit about a new program from the NRCS. And Don's actually going to go first and take a few minutes, and then Gene will be second. Uh, real quickly, as always, we have these backyard forestries every third Thursday of the month. Um, so stay tuned for um, what's coming next. We also are going to have some uh, woods walks coming up soon. So pay attention to our website and you'll probably get an email as well. But we're going to try to set up a couple at least this fall. So pay attention for that. And then as always, we have We'd love for you to join if you're not a member. Um, we have right now, actually, we have going on right now the New Jersey Woodland Stewards Program kicked off this evening and runs through Sunday. And actually, Don and Jean are both teaching at that this weekend. So it's a cool program. Uh, there's more more information on the website. We'll be doing it hopefully again next year. Um, and if you missed the presentation, an old one, we do record these backyard forestry, so you can jump on YouTube and uh, on our channel, and you can see some of the old presentations. And I think that's it. So I am gonna stop sharing. Oops, stop share, there we go. And Don, you're gonna take it away. Uh, all right. Oh, one more thing, folks, sorry. Q&A, please put your stuff in Q&A if you have a question. Drop it in the Q&A. Don's going to take just a couple minutes of questions, and then Gene will will take the bulk of time for questions at the tail end of the meeting. But if you have a, have a question, please post it in the q and I'll try to keep up with it. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I'm assuming you can see my screen, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, Andy asked me to come on uh, today just to give you a little rundown of this new initiative that we have uh, with NRCS. And those of you that may know me, uh, I, or I should say for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm Don Donnelly. I'm the state forester with NRCS New Jersey. Um, we um, engage with landowners to provide technical and financial assistance for conservation activities. And typically we work with forest landowners to deal with um, you know, typical strategies you to implement forest uh, stand improvement, uh, brush management, things like that. But with a lot of the increasing amount of dead ash trees, this um, kind of instigated a new initiative that we're calling a tree mortality mitigation initiative from damage causing agents. So I'm just going to run through this real quickly. Um, I thought, although we're applying it in forest land, I just thought I would give you a little bit of con uh, background on it that what really got this started was complaints from farmers uh, being funneled through the Depart New Jersey Department of Ag and the State Board of Ag that they have this increasing abundance of dead ash in their hedgerows and field edges, and they're having difficulty managing it. And so we didn't really have a program to address this to try and help uh, landowners in this capacity. So um, you may know that in the past year or so, there's been this Inflation Reduction Act funding that's come through Congress, which is in given us a big influx of uh, money to distribute for climate smart practices. So we figured this might be an opportunity to kind of address the increased uh, amount of mortality we're seeing and uh, also be able to distribute that money in a way that meets the objectives of the Inflation Act uh, Reduction Act, which is for, like I said, climate smart practices. So that was really the impetus. But then we got thinking, well, this really is a bigger issue than just farmers dealing with hedgerows. 
we're seeing an increase over the past decade or two decades of damage causing agents causing widespread mortality in forest stands as well. I put some of examples up here where this can be applied beyond just emerald ash borer and ash situations. Certainly we have uh, cycles where uh, southern pine beetle increase in our uh, pinelands forest and hard pines or yellow pines down there. Hemlock woolly adelgid and elongated hemlock scale have been an issue in hemlock stands and continue to be. Uh, that's something that has caused widespread mortality, the kind of things we're trying to target with this. More recently, we're seeing storm surge events and saltwater intrusion that are killing uh, Atlantic white cedar in riparian areas and coastal uh, set areas of the state. So this is kind of emblematic of what we're trying to address here. Obviously, oak decline from various pathogens, examples being things like gypsy moth, or now we have other concerns with bacterial leaf scorch and some other oak uh, ailments that might cause bigger problems. And some of these are cumulative stressors. So we're seeing, um, for example, even with the drought last year, um, there were places where we saw black birch dying back on these on the tops of ridges. And we're seeing some of that now getting, you know, boars and other things that are kind of building upon uh, uh, the drought stress. So, and then of course, this is relevant to tonight's talk that Gene's going to do on beech leaf disease, but even at beech bark has been growing in abundance in Northern New Jersey, at least over the past 10 years. So um, I did this talk for our own staff at NRCS to try and give them a sense of how to wrap their head around who would use this funding mechanism. And um, one of the questions, oops, sorry, I didn't mean for that to happen. One of the questions that, you know, we presented is if an applicant comes into your office with concerns for managing an unusual number of dead trees that are concentrated, and that's a key word here, in one or more areas of your farm or woodland, and this is done, and this is in a way that's beyond normal maintenance because of a damage causing agent. So we're trying to target things that are just beyond normal mortality in a forest or mortality that's kind of widely spread in a forest. We're really looking for areas like in this bottom left hand corner, that's an example of this storm surge where Atlantic white cedars killed back. In the lower right corner, that's a, a walnut ash stand where almost all the ash was killed back. We want to try and use certain practices above and beyond what our typical FSI and, and NRCS world standard uh, practice standards, that's forest stand improvement. We wanna go beyond that and be able to tr try and deal with mitigating some of these areas with a lot of mortality. So I thought maybe having a couple of examples would be helpful. And although this is for our staff, this question, we have um, screening tools to determine whether or not you're eligible. And, and one of those screening tools that we're using is, um, do dead and dying trees account for at least 25% of the total tree cover within what we're calling a target area on the property or an affected area? So I wanted to make the point that if you're thinking, if you own a woodlot and you have different stands, we're not talking about necessarily 25% of the entire stand. We're going to section out a piece of that stand and we want to try and delineate the concentration of ash. And we want to make sure that at least 25% of the total tree cover is impacted. And of course, this applies to hedgerows as well. So just from the examples here, they're kind of obvious, but the one on the right, we have that concentration. Yes, that's kind of what we're looking for. The one on the left where we have these dead trees kind of widely scattered through, that's probably not what this initiative is intended to try and address. And again, just kind of an illustration of the same thing I just put up there on the left, where you have individual trees scattered around. We're going to, you know, we can help with that. That would just be typical equip funding, but we want to deal with these areas where we have widespread loss. There's probably a lot of other competing vegetation or undesirable vegetation that may be inhibiting the establishment of new trees. And the purpose of this uh, through the IRA funding is to really kind of deal with the carbon issue and be able to start sequestering carbon again on these sites. <clears throat> and this last uh, illustration was just to kind of emphasize that that 25% being more um, evenly distributed through your stand on the left, um, while it's maybe 25%, it, it may not really be a good fit for this. So there's going to be some, because of the variation in all these stands, there's really going to be some 
uh, some um, kind of evaluation by our planners going out to determine how good of a fit it is. But if you're in doubt, I would say the first thing you can do if you have a forestry plan is to look at your stand data and to see if the species in question, for example, if we're talking about ash, do ash trees even comp comprise 25% of your, your stand data? So, and I say this because I think people sometimes feel like when they're looking at the mortality in their woodlot, they feel like there's a lot of trees there, but if you start tallying that up across the stand, it may not trigger our 25% threshold. And again, we're trying to get it, you know, concentrated in certain areas. I won't get into this too much. You know, in the NRCS world, we, we're we providing cost share assistance to deal with resource concerns. So there's a number of resource concerns that are obvious. But again, because we're using this IRA funding, which the purpose of that money is to to provide for climate smart practices, among them being carbon sequestration, tree planting is going to be required. I had this in our slide because we were first uh, doing this presentation for farmers, and I didn't want there to be the impression that farmers can just take out hedgerows and then do no replanting. But the same is going to apply with woodlots. Um, and unlike if you've received cost share funding from NRCS to do other tree planting practices where we were more flexible with the density. Um, in these situations, we're going to be following the stand our NRCS standards for re restocking pretty closely. So that's, in many cases, you'll be looking at probably at, at a minimum 400 trees to the acre that you'll be replanting at to be able to um, qualify for this funding. Um, this is probably relevant because maybe we have some people on here with farmland and woodland. And um, I just want to point out that we internally have different ways that we have to use practice, certain practices, depending on the land use. I don't, you know, that's just our logistics that we have to deal with. But in woodlands, we're going to be contracting this as FSI, our practice code 666, and using one of our more intense um, treatments under forest openings, either low density or heavy density, possibly shelter wood. We're going to be layering on things like woody residue treatment to help um, deal with all the slash to make the site accessible for replanting activities such as brush management. But the important part is if you do have farmland, um, we'll be using different practices for those hedgerows and field edges. And that is our obstruction removal number 500 practice. Um, and Recognizing that most of the time in our woodlands, we require a forestry plan. Um, we are trying to avoid this becoming a big drawn out process that's um, onerous. So if you have a farm field edge that's along a, wood, uh, along a woodland, we're going to treat the first 75 feet of that woodland as um, a different land use called associated ag land. We're going to have to work with FSA to remap those areas. And we're going to be able to use the obstruction removal practice in those areas. And then um, if it is though, in fact, in a, you know, in the center of a, a forested patch on your farm, or if you just have woodlands, you will need a forestry plan. Most of you are probably working with a, a consulting forester. So we can work with them to try and expedite the, um, if a plan amendment is needed. So if you're working in a regulated area, wetland, or a riparian zone, they may need to do an amendment. We can contract for a design and activity implementation, which would provide a little bit of money to help pay for your consultant to revise the plan to make sure you're compliant uh, with the DEP. Um, if you don't have a forester, we don't, you know, typically NRCS says, well, yeah, I got to go get a forester and then it's another year. But our plan here is to try and satisfy this internally through myself and other staff. We're going to fulfill the forestry compliant part of that to make sure that you're not running a miss uh, with uh, the regulation. So I just wanted to say that, that don't let that be a deterrent for you. We really want to get this money out quickly. Um, we have a deadline in October for signups for it. So if there's no obligation for you to fill out an application and send it in and engage with us, um, although we may be at work next week as the shutdown is uh, looking imminent. So you may not hear back from us for a while. Um, but that said, um, yeah, we want to try and get this out quickly. And the last thing is I put in the chat, it should be the first thing in the chat, this uh, mortality, tree mortality mitigation initiative fact sheet that we developed. 
It really doesn't say anything too much more than what I just said, but it's you can download that PDF and take it with you um, tonight to get like a little bit, read through it, get a little bit better sense. And then I would encourage you, if you're interested, to reach out to your local NRCS office, um, depending on where you are. That could be Hackettstown, Freehold, uh, Frenchtown, Vineland, or Woodstown. So um, with that, I'll, I'm, I probably went a little longer than I should have, but... Um, if you had any okay. immediate questions, I'll answer them. But if not, we can move on and get Gene on course. Yeah, I think we'll just. Uh, I don't see any new things in the chats or in the uh, Q and A. So I think I think we'll move on. But main main thing here, guys, if you have if you think you're a candidate, contact your local office, um, and um, they should be able to point you in the right direction. And like Don said, there is that sheet. Hold on, I may have a question here. I don't see the PDF. Hey, Don, will you post that again in the chat one more time? Okay. Don's okay. going to post that again in the chat. Look for it. It's a it's a PDF. Um, and I'm going to work hard here to following this meeting. I don't really know how to do it, but I'll ask Lori to maybe send an email out to everybody who attended the meeting. And I will make sure that PDF goes out to the attendees so you at least have that so and yeah. it's there again guys yeah so check the chat you should see the pdf there are we ready to roll okay gene let's let's get her going here great well hi everyone i'm gene epifan from rutgers uh cooperative extension in morris county um i am a licensed tree expert and a certified arborist as well and um, I'm here to share with you some sad news about beach and beach leaf disease. And I've, I've given this talk a couple of times and I've, to I've been told that I should warn people that they need to grab their uh, something to comfort them, like their favorite teddy bear or I don't know, a bottle of tequila or something. But I'm not encouraging any of any, anything uh, um, that you really shouldn't be doing. But in any case, here we go. Just. Uh, be prepared. Some of this stuff's going to be rather sad. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, just to review, um, beach belong to the genus Fagus. We have both native and non-native species here in New Jersey. The native species is American beech, Fagus grandifolia, which is a common tree in many forest types in New Jersey. The map in the center of the screen shows the forests in green. The main exotic beach species in New Jersey is European beach, Fagus sylvatica. And it's many varieties, including the purple-leaved ones, tricolored beach, there's weeping ones, and those are commonly planted throughout um, developed environments and suburbs. And in the map, those areas are in pink. But in those pink areas, American beach and European beach coexist because there's many uh, developed areas where people still retain uh, beach on their properties. So just a note on plant ID, um, the difference between the two, because not all European varieties have purple leaves, which is really a, a distinct character. Um, but if you come in, come across a green leafed European beach, you may be a little confused. Of course, they have the same type of bark, very smooth, same buds, long and pointy. However, the leaves are pretty different. Even though they have parallel venation, the European beech has a wavy leaf margin and it isn't as um, uh, dentate. And they have a, they're rounder and smaller leaf. But unfortunately, both of these species will be greatly impacted by beech leaf disease. Now, beech leaf disease, um, what we know about it is that it came in in Ohio in 2012. It, since then, it has spread across up to Maine and is now down to Virginia. And it is across most of uh, northern New Jersey, except for one little county, Hudson, which I don't even know if Hudson County does have beach. If anybody hears from Hudson and you have beach, uh, please, I'd be interested to know. And then um, we haven't had any reportings yet in the this most southern counties of New Jersey, but I do anticipate that um, we'll be hearing from them soon that, that they will have BLD within the next year or two. So 
what's really tragic about this disease is mature beech can die within six to 10 years. And some reports have even shown um, it can be faster, even four years, and saplings can die in one to two years. The uh, infected leaves of beech are rather diagnostic. They're pretty unmistakable with this banding pattern, but the best way to recognize it is to hold an affected leaf up to a light source like the sky, and then you can see the uh, opaque infected tissue against the translucent uninfected tissue. When the, the leaves become infected, they end up shriveling up and um, over the, the course of the growing season and fall off. And that is one of the, the ways, the strategies that uh, kills these beech. Effectively, they defoliate and they're not able to photosynthesize any longer. These are just a couple examples of um, defoliating beech. The left one is a European beech and on the right we have our American beech. And just to show you here, um, this is a photo I took in Jockey Hollow, which is at Morristown National Historical Park. And actually this is the New Jersey Brigade area in that same park. There was only a minor BLD infection in 2021 and not even a full year later at the end of summer 2022, we've had greater than 50% infected um, canopies. So it is a fast spreading um, disease, unfortunately. So regarding its pathogenesis, beech leaf disease is caused by an invasive nematode, Lydilentius cranate subspecies mechanii, but we can call it the LCM nematode, so I don't have to say that again. <laughs> um, this subspecies is, uh, from the, its original species, Lydilentius cornate, that lives on Japanese beach, and and they live in the buds and the leaves only. The main assumption is that the subspecies is also exotic, and somehow stemmed off and turned into its own subspecies and made its way here. But its exact origin hasn't been placed a hundred percent. But we do assume that it is an invasive species not originating from the United States. The infection court is the leaf bud. That is, we have that pictured here in the center. Um, the roots, the twigs, and the wood have not been shown to carry the nematode. So the nematode is restricted to the leaves and the buds only. But that's also what makes treatment difficult. And we'll talk about treatment a little bit further on. Um, when the leaf uh, bud unfurls in spring, the damage is already done because the leaf became infected in when it was the leaf was in its bud stage, either in summer, fall, or winter prior to that damaged leaf unfurling. And what we also found out that the timing of when um, the, the nematode actually leaves the leaves to try to get back to the next year's bud to infect it is the second half of the growing season. And that's really important in terms of timing for treatment. But this was a, a, a new finding and that's how um, now we've been able to develop a few treatments. In any case, another aspect about beech leaf disease and about the nematode is that they can be moved by rainwater. So in um, seasons like this year, we've had a lot of rain, the nematodes uh, were likely flush to the lower canopies of beech. And even though last year we had terrible drought and very little rain during the summer, we still saw the same effect of more infection in the lower canopies first. And that could be a product of potentially the the rainwater flushing the the nematodes down into the lower canopies. So what do we know about the vectors? Well, there's nothing concrete yet. Again, this is still a new disease. There's studies are ongoing, but birds are suspected. Many species of birds have been found carrying the LCM nematode um, on their bodies or in their digestive systems or in their mouths. And what we suspect is that these birds, many species eat beech buds in 
the end of summer, fall, and winter. And that's one way that the uh, beach could become infected. But potentially arthropods can also move around these nematodes. These nematodes are microscopic. They are very small and they can be picked up on insects that we could see and be transferred to other parts of the canopy. So potentially arthropods are um, uh, could infect other parts of the canopy. Say, for instance, the rainwater flushes them down, but arthropods and potentially birds can make an uh, create an infection further up in the canopy. So um, furthermore, we have uh, no real conclusions about all of these, but all, all of this are educated guesses and assumptions. Also, we found um, there's been some microbial studies and we found that this LCM nematode uh, has, um, uh, what is it called? Um, it, endosymbionts. So the we we found that not we not me, but scientists have found that um there are different bacteria found on affected leaves versus unaffected leaves. And the same thing for fungal communities. And one of the bacteria that's been found that it actually assists the nematode in its fitness and its reproduction and it makes it more virulent. So potentially these, these findings are helping us to unlock ways into potentially uh, treating or killing the nematode or finding a way to save our beaches. But at this point, um, we have a lot at stake in New Jersey and finding the, um, the way to treat these beaches, the way to save them, the way to save some of our ecosystems is going to take a lot of time and we don't have that, that kind of time. So there is going to be a lot of mortality occurring um, in northern New Jersey, where this hit first. Our greenhouse stocks are um, becoming infected. At this point, it doesn't really make too much sense to be selling beach um, in northern New Jersey. And it, I've heard of um, nurseries actually destroying their stock and cut, take, cutting their losses. Um, it is a, a really sad situation. So I'm just warning people to don't go and buy new beach and plant them in their yard. Don't uh, don't start growing more beach at this moment in time. This is their fate is uncertain. It really doesn't make sense. Um, in southern New Jersey, we haven't seen BLD yet in the far south of New Jersey, but I bet you it's coming. It's, it's already down in Virginia. So. BLD will cause substantial economic loss uh, for these trades. They'll also cause a lot of ecological loss. We will probably have a boom in terms of um, tree work, just as we had with other removals of these devastating diseases like emerald ash borer. However, it, in general, this will turn out to be um, an economic loss for the green industry. So in general, we have this economic loss of a lot of the beech that are grown in the state and are planted throughout the state, but the true largest loss that we are going to see is our ecosystem services of our forests that have beech, and especially the ones that are dominated by beech. So the next few slides I'm going to be uh, reviewing the ecosystems around beech and anticipated consequences that we're going to see because of um, the, the beach loss throughout the state. But just to review, American beach's native range is through most of the Eastern United States, as well as most of New Jersey. Beach is found in uh, all five physiographic regions in uh, several forest types, primarily dry mesic oak hickory or oak hickory forest, as well as Northern hardwood forest. That's in the Northern section. In the Southern part of the state, they're found as a component of the coastal plain hardwood forests that include oak and hickory cohorts. Beach is um, common to find in most mature forests throughout the state, except for this one section, which is dominated by pines. These are our pinelands and beach doesn't really occur here, as well as uh, along the coast. We don't really find too many beach right along our coastline. So just to review, uh, beach is found in 
uplands and mountain slopes, as well as bottomland stream banks and seeps throughout New Jersey. In some literature, beech is listed as a lowland species, but since we don't have very high mountain tops in New Jersey, it's really throughout the majority of our uplands and lowland landscapes. And um, importantly, beech is what we call climax associated. It is a dominant tree of the later succession for forest types that are shown here in this diagram. The, in northern hardwood forests, beech can be found with climax cohorts, sugar maple and hemlock, while in oak hickory forests, beech are often grow alongside the oldest oaks of the climax forest. Another typical trait of climax species, including beech, is that they are very shade tolerant, but they also create deep shade. And to be clear, this image shows primary forest succession, but in New Jersey, we mostly have secondary succession. Secondary meaning post harvest, the majority of New Jersey's forests have been cut down at least once. So this combination of two diagrams really shows um, the forest succession and the, the shift from a mature oak forest to including a little bit more beech once it reaches its latest succession stage. So What's a bit, dev well, not just a bit, what's very devastating about this situation with beech leaf disease is that beech have always been this stronghold in our climax forest environments. And they provide substantial habitat as well as ecosystem services. Um, they prevent, they help to prevent invasive species infiltration, for example, which is a major threat. And losing these climax foreign systems will have widespread consequences. So we're going to go over a few of these in the next slides. So as many of you know, beech nuts are one of the most sought after foods for many species of forest animals. They are a superfood for wildlife. They are very rich in proteins and fats. Um, and they're vital for many species to survive through the winter, especially since we've already lost chestnut. So they've, as we lose certain species, um, our wildlife are depending more on the ones that we still have. And once we lose beech, it's going to be ever more crucial to maintain other um, types of nuts like oaks and hickories. But we're going to talk about that a little bit further on. The amount of protein found in beech nuts, though, is around double the amount found in acorns, which is pretty amazing. And unfortunately, it's going to be devastating to lose this resource. On top of the, the, the nuts, the buds are also eaten by birds, as I mentioned. Um, the sap is eaten by the yellow-bellied sapsucker. And even the leaves, of course, are bra browsed by deer. But unfortunately, losing beech, we're still not going to lose deer. <laughs> so beech also provide valuable habitat for many species of insects. They host over 100 species of butterflies and moth caterpillars, like the early hair streak shown here, the white prominent, white streak prominent. Um, and then beech host many wood boring beetles and leaf hoppers. Caterpillars, beetles, and leaf hoppers are important foundational parts of our forest food web. And for example, caterpillars are vital to the growth and health of newly hatched birds called nestlings. Caterpillars are the most nutritious food source available for nestlings, as Doug Tallamy has taught us. And our native birds have evolved to raise their young on caterpillars. So losing host plants of these insects will cascade into negative impacts of, in our ecosystems. Some other insects that live on beach include, um, well, what people think are pests, but they really are part of our beach forest ecosystem. Um, this native beach blight aphid here shown, it looks like those white uh, puffy little insects. They, you might see that walking through a beach forest and they're actually part of the ecosystem, even though some of us might find them to be pests. And they end up um, creating these piles of excrement that uh, get covered in a sooty mold. And e there's even, um, the sooty mold is called the beach aphid poop eater. Imagine that, that's kind of funny. And but it removes pollutants from the air, this sooty mold. So even the sooty mold that has a function in our forested ecosystem. 
Other common um, insects or bugs that live on beach include the beach leaf rolling aphid or areophid mites. And both of these are native and cause, cause no real harm to beach. They also have their own insect, spider, and centipede predators, and um, as they are also part of our forest food web. So without beach in our forest, all, all of these species could be potentially extirpated or worse. The loss of um, beach can really cascade into mass losses throughout the food web. So American beech also have an interesting species-specific uh, relationship with a root parasite called beech drops, Epiphagus virginiana. Because of this, beech drops, of course, are only found under beech. This parasite requires beech only, and it needs to live near its root system. And that's how it, it taps its root system for water and nutrients. Beech drops cannot survive on their own, and they lack chlorophyll. That's why they are in green. And they're also really difficult to see in the forest. So you can see my not so great pictures in the forest on the right. And that's why I've circled the beach drops in red. And that little circle on the beach drops is actually a bumblebee that I found foraging the flowers of beach drops late summer at a time when there isn't a lot flowering in the forest, but especially under beach canopies. You don't really, you naturally don't have a lot of wildflowers, but beech drops provide that resource for pollinators in the climax forest woods. So another very important aspect of um, the habitat that beech create is in leaf litter. Leaf, the, the leaves of beech that I'm gonna be mentioning again in the next slides because they're so important degrade very slowly and they provide very important habitat as well as camouflage for many uh, species of wildlife and insects. They also provide overwintering sites. Many insects do need leaf litter for overwintering, whether they're actually in the leaves curled up in them or burrowing below them in the soil. Beach also exhibit what's called uh, marquescence they hold on to their leaves into the winter and that also creates habitat. You usually only find this in small specimens or the clonal saplings below the canopy where that is a very important place to provide winter habitat and perfection, per, uh, protection from winds. But you can also see it in the canopies as you, where uh, this photo on the right, I took a picture of a great horned owl up in there um, taking some shelter from some stronger winds. So, as I just mentioned, beech have uh, this clonal growth habit. And when they become well-established, they can really dominate a site and turn into thick groves. These clonal sprouts are really important for providing cover. And all that leaf cover is very important for shade and uh, rain interception, as well as nesting habitat. For instance, our wood thrush are... Um, their preferred nesting sites are in dense beech sapling groves. This is another example of the clonal, clonal growth habit. Um, and when a, a mature beech is growing and it and it's and it's growing its its uh, clonal saplings like its children, they grow up and they also become mature trees and they stay occupying the site. So, throughout time, and and even in this really established beech forest, you can find ground cover beech, sapling stage beech, mid story beech, and mature tall beech, and all of that serves as incredible shelter, leaf cover, and rain interception. So the rain interception aspect is really important because without that leaf interception, that rain could be much harder onto the ground and create erosion. So beach, in the, in the fact that they have all of these layers of vegetation really are helpful in masses in beach forests to, to uh, curb hard rains and erosion. And as with climate change, we're seeing stronger storms, we're seeing more water put down, 
um, in a shorter period of time that these beach really serve a very important function. And here's some winter photos of beach and they the even this pattern of clonal growth helped to hold slopes along riparian corridors or hillsides. So it's not even just the leaves, it's even the entire root systems help to prevent erosion. And then, so centered here is a map of New Jersey's class one streams. Beach is often a dominant tree of the riparian gallery forest in the inland class one streams in our state. I'm not talking about the, um, the, the coastal streams here. I'm talking about further inland, even in Monmouth and some southern counties, but especially in the northern counties of the state. Beach are common in these mountain seeps and swamps that even feed into class one streams. And these class one streams are very high quality locations that um, create that provide habitat as for um, an abundant species that are even at risk, and especially for cold water fisheries. Beach provide such dense and deep shade and they stretch out over stream sides and they help keep these class one streams cool for especially during hot summer months when trout need their temperatures regulated. Otherwise, they can't survive. So if these temperatures are elevated for too long, the trout streams may no longer support trout in the future. And if we lose beach, it's this is a very likely scenario. So here's just a couple photographic examples of um, some riparian beach. On the left is some sphagnum moss I found underneath the feet of some beautiful beach that even growing some trout lily in the seep that feed into these class one streams. And this is the tributary of the Passaic here on the right and the, uh, surrounded by a beach forest. Places like these are going to be losing their canopies. And this is something that we really need to mitigate as best as possible. Another ecosystem service in general that I did already touch upon is climate control, but it's not just for our trout and our streams. It's also in general for New Jersey. Beach provides so much shade and without beach, our, the temperatures in the forest will be higher and the temperatures, um, throughout our state may even be higher. So as BLD advances into defoliation stages, there will be more light reaching the ground and more canopy gaps created. And this allows for invasive plants to move in. Unfortunately, canopy gaps in New Jersey forests are no longer poised to regenerate uh, native forest trees. Overabundant deer browsing of seedlings coupled with the invasion of exotic plants prevents forests from naturally regrowing in the canopy gaps as they once did. Now serious human intervention is required to proactively plant and regrow forests. Without intervention, invasive plants will infiltrate and dominate these beach forest areas. And here's a few slides of canopy gaps that... Um, uh, prove what I've I've just spoken to that our canopy gaps are no longer regrowing native trees. This is the location. This is the disturbance, the disturbance area where invasive plants are poised to invade. Here's a few of our uh, infamous invasive shrubs: multiflora rose, Japanese barberry, and wineberry. Very common in our canopy gaps, and they really um, compete and hog all the resources to make it uh, impossible for most of our native trees to get through. Here's some new invaders: um, Asiatic photinia, as well as Cybold viburnum. Even though they've been around, they're still considered emerging because they're not widespread yet. So to summarize, um, with BLD advancing in beach forests, it will harm our natural ecosystems around beach. The 
shelter, larval hosting, forage, ecological communities, the soil quality beach foster could be devastated. Beach nuts, as we discussed, are a critical food source for many animals. The loss of beach is predicted to be um, to put significant stress on many wildlife populations. Plus, these animals are even more dependent on beech nuts now than ever before, as historic food sources um, have disappeared or are declining. And are like uh, chestnuts, as I've mentioned. And we are also worried about our red oak group um, because of bacterial leaf scorch. So there's a lot of um, threats that we're facing in our forests. So even more unforeseen impacts may occur, but only time will reveal them. And let's hope that the sun is not setting on our beach forest, but we have to be prepared as it is. So I'm gonna switch gears here and discuss uh, progress and treatment trials. And then we'll, after that, we'll discuss steps for mitigation. So I said a lot of bad news. Here's a little bit of good news. Um, we've had success in uh, ongoing treatment trials. Research have been researchers have been working very hard on um, these uh, few products here. Um, these treatments are not solutions for our forest expanses of beach. However, they can be small scale. Um, uh, tools that we can use in small scale areas that um, can help preserve beach in private woodlands or um, suburban backyards in parklands or arboretum. But these are all experimental. So uh, keep that in mind. If you need help um, with managing beach leaf disease, you call your licensed tree expert first. But we're going to go over some of treatments that are available and some treatments that are on the horizon. So polyphosphate 30 is um, found in fertilizers by the plant food company in Pendleton Turf Supply. Uh, Davy Tree and Cleveland Metro Parks perform these trials uh, using polyphosphate 30 as a soil drench on pole sized beach. So the beach were two to four inches DBH. Um, they applied this twice uh, per growing season between May and August, one month apart for five years, and results have shown significant uh, decrease in the foliar nematodes. So that's really some great news, but studies are ongoing with larger sized beach, so we don't really have any concrete data yet on the impact or the benefit for larger trees. However, there are suggested application rates. Um, they're a bit complicated, so I would want you to go straight to the source um, where I found these, which is at, uh, at the in the small font at the bottom of the slide. It's the Beach Leaf Disease Treatment Update by Heather Faubert um, from URI. So with polyphosphate 30, um, if one were to apply this, you'd move the leaf litter away from the application area and you'd move it away from the root flare all the way to the drip line. You'd um, moisten the soil with water if the soil's dry, then you'd apply the mixture of this polyphosphate product without touching the roots of the root flare, and then after you'd replace the leaf litter. Now, now we also have phosphite fungicide products. Now these are already products that are labeled for beach, even though they're not really labeled for beach leaf disease. They treat fungi, the fungicide. How I mean, they treat um, fungal infections because they're a fungicide, but they have shown that they can um, uh, reduce stress on the beach and improve health of beach. So these fungicides are. Um, like agrifos or reliant, and they are known to stimulate plant defenses. So if you can, it's best to use them as a soil drench, but you must follow the label. The label is the law. I would not recommend putting um, doing root flare injections of 
polyphosphite 30, um, you need to follow the labels. But if you can, do a soil drench if that's on the label. That's the best case scenario for this type of um, phosphorus product. So next is fluoropyram. Now, these studies um, were performed by Bartlett Research Labs and the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And they've used fluoropyram as a, uh, on fo for foliar applications. They did four applications during the timing, the time period when the nematodes are leaving the leaves, when they're the most active in the second half of the growing season, which is around the mid to end of July up until the first hard frost. The results of this application, doing four applications, have shown some good disease control, um, a decrease in um, symptoms, as well as a significant decrease in the LCM nematode in the next year's buds, which is probably the most important part of um, the trial. So they've now that they found that fluoropyram works as indemnify, but indemnify is not a product that's labeled for beach. So Fluoropyrum is also an ingredient in broad form. Now, broad form is labeled for beech, even though it's not yet labeled for beech leaf disease. So they, the uh, researchers compared indemnify versus broad form, and they found no difference in results, which is fantastic. Even though fluoropyrum is in both of them, broad form, has a, uh, the concentration is a little less than what's in indemnify. So because of that success, uh, they did another, some more research in Connecticut forests, and they tried the foli ap foliar application in these wooded areas. The results were kind of mixed, and that's because of foliar coverage. It is not easy to cover a tree completely in all of its leaves with a product. So of course, it worked better on mixed stands of forest that didn't have dense beach and beach that were smaller so the all the canopy could be reached because a lot of these um uh th like the, the the application methods they don't can't necessarily get up to the tops of beach unless you have it maybe even if you have a professional uh, uh an applicator in a bucket truck you know, all the way uh, halfway up in the canopy, they still might not be able to reach the tops. So in general, the uh, just to review, the poor candidate sites are um, for fluoropyram would be very tall beach or beach that already are dying back and have serious disease issues, like in this photo on the left. Um, and then Poor, um, poor sites would be dense beech forests with way too many leaves to cover because there's just so much inoculum. You just can't reach them all. And also fluoropyram should not be applied near water. So beech that are in riparian um, sites are not good, are, are not be trees that should be treated with fluoropyram. But you can use fluoropyram for um, a variety of other sites, beach that have minimal dieback from other diseases, beach hedges, small to medium specimens, um, understory or intermediate height trees, and even some mixed forest stands. You may be able to get as high as you can into the tops of beach canopies if you put the, um, the uh if the the person who is applying this would is comfortable with going up in a bucket truck and getting a good uh 30 feet higher into the canopy so here's an experimental treatment schedule if anybody here is a licensed tree expert this is a one of the slides you might want to take a look at um and and take a screenshot of so it suggest, uh, researchers suggest if you were to combine both products, you can use the phosphite soil drench, um, two applications, 28 days apart. 
in the first half of the growing season. And then in the second half, you can do your fluoropyram um, spraying with broad form. However, the broad form label requires that you cycle in another product. You can't just do four um, straight broad form applications. You need to cycle in another product that you can use on beach and Reliant is what is recommended. For the broad form, you can do 21 day intervals and then after Reliant, you can do a 14 day interval. Now this period of time more or less covers the second half of the growing season. However, sometimes we really stay warm until even halfway through November. So um, this is a really hefty treatment schedule. Here's another version of an, an alternative experimental treatment schedule. Again, because the researchers and people doing these trials, they found out things that work, but they also are just developing the best strategies. So no one is concrete with whether this prior slide here or this one here would be a better scenario. Both will probably provide good control and coverage for um, this nematode and will prevent help to prevent um, dieback with beech leaf disease. So the difference with this alternative um, has the phosphate drench closer to when you're doing the Reliant application in August. But we have some other good news. So there's been a trial of thibendazole, which is um, sold as Arbitec 20S. Thibendazole is currently labeled for Dutch elm disease and sycamore anthracnose. It is injected into the base of trees. The best injection location, just, in, just to review, is not the collar of the tree. It's the sides of the root flares. So your root flares must be exposed. That's paramount. Um, now back to thibendazole. It's a systemic fungicide. It's not yet labeled for beech, but we're hoping to get the label because it's shown that um, it has success. It's been used uh, the, on Bartlett trial on uh, 10 inch to 22 inch DBH trees, they've only applied one injection. Instead of doing four foliar sprays, you can do one injection and have really great success. And it works for taller trees than maybe what in comparison to a fluoropyram spray might be more difficult to reach the tops of these canopies. So thiabendazole was... Um, reduced the LCM nematode and dormant buds by 80%. It reduced uh, BLD symptoms by 50% and it completely prevented dieback. So it is, there's a lot of hope in this product and we're really looking forward to it replacing a fluoropyram spray schedule. However, it is good to just have both tools in the toolbox because uh, some researchers are saying that even the fluoropyram might not be the best case scenario in the long run because the nematode might develop a resistance. So it's it no matter what we use, we have to keep developing as many um, products to be able to treat this and as many strategies as we do in integrative pest management. Now, here's another product called KytoCure. It's a chitin product. It's non-toxic. Uh, it's organic. It's, um, I'm sorry, it's not a, a chitin product. It's a chitosan product. And what it, does, what it does is it hydrolyzes chitin. Now, chitin is in fungus, but it's also a component of the cuticle of a nematode. The cuticle is like the equivalent of an exoskeleton of a nematode. So if it dissolves chitin, it actually dissolves the cuticle of the nematode. So, uh, Kytocure has been shown to be very effective on root knot nematode and other nematodes. It hasn't yet been tested um, for beech leaf disease or um, the, the LCM nematode. However, we're going to start some trials potentially, and I'm um, gathering interested folks 
if they're in uh, who own nurseries who may want to try to apply this on their nursery crops if they haven't destroyed them or gotten rid of them yet. Um, this may be a really good um, altruistic thing you can do with your beach. If you can't be selling them, you can maybe help us test some of these products out on on um, stock that is too small to you to do a root flare injection to. So we learn about treatments, but treatments are not for everybody. And also a lot of these treatments will really not save the, the majority of our forests that have beach. Um, so there are some other strategies that we can use. Pruning might not help in a forest scenario, but it might help in a small scale woodlot scenario. You can prune out the infection, but honestly, it's just going to delay what's our, what's going to happen. So you can prune out in affected leaves in northern new jersey you kind of miss the boat unless uh there might be a few pockets here and there where they're just starting some new infections but in southern new jersey you may be able to prolong heavy infection on your property if you prune out the affected parts of the canopy but you don't want to just grab the leaves you need to get the buds out too that are near the infected leaves and you want to dispose of um the the material in the trash you don't want to compost it because we still don't know how easily it can pass from one area to another even if we're part of that scenario if we can pass it by walking on infected leaves and bring it to another area we don't know this yet it's it's uh completely plausible so again don't compost them another way that we can help protect our beach is just reducing the stress on them so the next uh, step involves multiple ways that we really want to um, uh, help to protect our beach by avoiding uh, damage. So we don't want to, uh, we want to avoid construction. We want to avoid um, uh, a heavy tree work near beaches with heavy machinery because we want to reduce soil compaction or root damage. Another aspect is, it's not grass is not the greatest uh, thing to have right up against your trees under the roots and, and in between the roots and next to the root flare. That mower is going to be compacting that soil. It's going to be damaging the root systems. And that's not ideal. Um, and at the same time, when you, the soil is compacted, it makes it so the water holding capacity is uh, reduced. So when it rains, that soil doesn't hold on to its water long enough. And in the droughty years, that can be really significant. So for instance, in this mature beach here, the rooting zone is like the majority of this, um, this photo. And that's an area where you really don't wanna be having grass. So an alternative to this would be um, having a light layer of mulch, leaf litter, or potentially a perennial native garden. Those are all uh, much less uh, detrimental to the health of a beach. Another thing that we just really want to avoid, let's not volcano mulch our beach. Let's not pile anything like rocks around its root collar. Those are both stressful. And let's absolutely stop accidental girdling. These are things that we commonly see in urban and suburban environments. So all of that will just stress your beach out even further. We want to reduce that. And these are poor practices. They reduce tree immunity for any species. Now, uh, this is really important. We, we also want to reduce um, uh, invasion. And so what do we, we need to remove our invasive plants that are near these beach. Um, I did jump the gun. I'm sorry. Let's let's just step back. We want to water during droughts and heat waves. That's for every large, mature, even young tree you have, but it's going to be especially important for diseased plants such as our beach. Um, but back to the invasive plants. So we want to remove invasive plants that may cause harm to these trees because invasive plants have competitive mechanisms that inhibit the growth or the health or the plant immunity of our natives. For instance, um, ailanthus Ilan trees are allelopathic. Japanese barberry, over time, as, as it sheds its leaves every year, increases the pH in the soil. 
there's other species like Norway maple that cause it, that create excessive shade or they they are very um they're water hogging trees. So uh, these other trees are going to compete with beech and be detrimental to them. We don't want them near our beech trees if we're trying to save them. And if you're going to be treating beech and investing in this, that's especially, you know, you don't want to be working against it by allowing invasive plants to be uh, succeeding near them and competing against them. Another aspect is in a forested system or in a woodlot, when we're gonna be losing these beech, say for instance, across the stream, this Japanese barberry in, in the, uh, the foreground is gonna easily seed itself once we, we lose the beech in the background and they're gonna move right in. So if you have invasive plants nearby and you're losing your beech, that canopy opening up is going to facilitate invasion. So just an, multiple reasons why not to have invasive species. Now, this is the most important step that I feel that is going to help our ecosystems at a whole, as a whole to mitigate the negative impacts of beach loss. And it is planting trees, but not just any trees. They have to be specific species and certain sizes. And I'll review. So we need to artificially regenerate. So since we have deer, we're not getting the seedlings coming in. We, we do have um, low recruitment of a lot of species. If we have seedlings coming in naturally, that's great, but the deer are eating them, so they have to be caged. And if we don't have enough of the right species of seedlings coming in, we want to be able to buy them. Um, so we want to proactively plant our native cohort species. The, and plant them densely around our declining beach. We really want to be focusing on our white oak group oaks and hickory species. These are especially important because they're going to have those same, um, those compounds that are um, so important that, that degrade slowly over time in the leaf litter. So the oak leaf litter has high tannins as well and is high in lignin. So those are really important to keep in our ecosystem and to be, we really want to be planting the oaks um, to replace our beach and especially the white oak group oaks. We want to focus on local porogeny, our local ecotypes. We want to try our best to find small size stock versus large size stock. They grow faster, they grow healthier, they have fewer diseases. They suffer less from transplant shock. And um, in general, in the smaller stock has just greater success rates and greater survival in comparison to bound and burlap large trees. So we really want to focus on getting many small trees in and not just a couple uh, larger bound and burlap trees. So it, the investment is in the the cages to protect the trees. So we want to plant in stands, but the best case scenario is to individually cage each tree. So you can see to prevent deer herbivory, you can see this photo closer to the center. We want to have some openness so the, the tree can have um, a little bit of leaf spread and leaf cover. And then once it gets tall enough and turns into a sapling, we want to make sure to keep its trunk protected. Now, deer are still rubbing their trees that are even up to six inches or even sometimes eight inches if they're preferred species. So we really want to keep these um, uh trunk covers on as long as possible. And the best case scenario for protection for trees are, are, are the material that's the best to use are materials that don't require constant upkeep that will last for many years over time and allow for air circulation. So that's really important. We don't want to create a fungal issue or, or um, anything worse. So Please take a screenshot of this. These are the species that I recommend that need um, that I think should be planted under beach, in beach forests, in backyards where beach are, where they're declining, in um, urban parks under beach. We really want these species, we want more of them 
uh, regenerating in all of New Jersey. So these are beach cohorts trees. However, these are also a list of trees that, that should be replacing the ash that we've already lost. So these are the trees that we don't have enough of planted in our landscapes. We are not having enough recruitment um, in our forests. And the the ones in bold are especially important. So I I hope you um, took a picture of this. And I just want to say a note. There's several species that are not on this list that you th might think, oh, why not? Well, one is the red oak group are susceptible, highly susceptible to bacterial leaf scorch. So at this moment, I'm not recommending to plant the red oak group oaks until we get a better handle on that. Maybe in some forest settings that are still pristine, we you can get away with it and they'll be healthy, but I don't want to bring um, a susceptible species into a system that could maybe infect other species. And I did avoid ecologically rare plants of New Jersey. Um, because our natural heritage program and natural lands trust um, does not prefer us to be planting ecologically rare species. And also, um, I don't have species that are not actually native to New Jersey, but are native adjacent, like a lot of our leguminous species that change the soil and um, make it better for themselves. They increase nitrogen in the soil. However, that also increases and facilitates invasion. These leguminous species are not part of our oak hickory forest of New Jersey, and they are not um, listed even historically as part of our forests in New Jersey. They've been planted in as we came in and started to utilize our landscapes. So I don't want to go too far on that tangent. I'd love to... Um, answer any questions and where Wait. am I? Maybe should I, uh, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. And then I can see the questions. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Jean, thank you. That was super, super thorough. That was awesome. Um, uh, so I've got a let me just let me just grab a couple questions here out of the chat real quick. I've got some in Q&A, but just a couple quick ones. OK, are, are wood chips safe to use if beech were cut down and thrown through a chipper? Are we OK to use that for paths and gardens, et cetera? Um, the thing is, so the nematode is really spread throughout. What I would say is if you're going to use wood chips, don't transfer them to a location where beech leaf disease isn't there yet. Um, like I mentioned before, the leaves and the buds are the only place where the nematodes are. So if you, you know, the majority of wood chips is actually wood. So you're most likely safe, but you could transfer it to a new location. So I would say if you're trying to prevent, um, beech leaf disease spread in an area, don't use those wood chips there. But if you're if if you're in an area where it's rampant, it's not going to make a difference. Got it. Um, here's just a comment from Greg Lombardi. Gene, you are correct about listening with a favorite blanket or teddy bear. <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Um, another one. Uh, I collected beech nuts from seemingly healthy trees. Will the seeds carry the disease? As far as we know, they don't, but um, I don't, I'm not, I haven't heard anyone testing that. I don't think that they do. We, um, researchers have concluded that they are restricted to the leaf buds and the leaves, but during that, the stage when the nematodes are leaving the leaves, they can get onto a vector. Like if a bird lands by the leaf, they can get onto that bird. So we don't know if there are nematodes. I mean, they're microscopic. We don't know if they would potentially be on the outside part of a of a beech nut, you know, that husk with the little barbs on it. We don't know this, but they not they're not the the nut is not what they want. They don't want to be that. That's not where their food source is, so they likely will not survive that long. 
Got it. Another question where beech trees grow in clones, do they all show BLD together? And if the entire clone is infected, do they all need to be treated together for the treatment to be effective? So I guess, can you treat one tree or do you have to treat all the trees? So basically the target way to treat, like say if you're doing um, the, in the future when we can, do a side bend to solve root flare injection you treat the mother tree probably first and 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 then see if that works for the lower canopy um, because they're all connected as as clones when you're doing a foliar application you're getting it on all the leaves regardless of whether they're the young clones or the tall ones you're you're just targeting leaf cover so um i hope that answered your question they are connected in the root system but of course like they have um, researchers haven't yet developed all the nuances between how much product you need for the size of the tree. And then how much does that factor into how many clonal saplings there are? How, you know, we don't know that yet. Got it. How about, you may have said something about this, but do you know if they're working on any kind of like resistant beach already, like they do with other yeah, species. you know, I think this is so fast spreading that that's that's something that hasn't really um, been brought up as in in at least in my circles yet, um, because we do th we're we're watching this infection spread so rapidly, but I think that if people were seeing certain beach that weren't being infected, that they would be you know, contacting people like me and, and foresters and Don Don and I, but I don't, I haven't heard any beach, any American beach or European beach being resistant, unfortunately. Okay. Um, what was this question? Oh, would a cold winter help control beach leaf disease? Do they know, you know anything about that? I wish or or maybe I or maybe I wish hot weather would since you know climate change and all. But the thing is, I I doubt it because the original species that this um subspecies evolved from is from just the other side of the world in our same climate. So they probably have their same climate extremes, and I doubt that it's going to really make a difference. Unfortunately. Okay, another comment that was scary. That's good. It is. <laughs> um, I manage a 2,000 acre beach climax forest in Massachusetts. We're screwed. <laughs> well, that's why like the plan, the best case scenario is to plant. Get your local perogeny from your growers that grow for forest restoration or they grow for um, ecological restoration and plant and do what you can as much as like try to get your closest local progeny to your forest type and plant those species that I listed. Cause that's all that we can really do in a mass scale. And if your retail or nurseries or even wholesale nurseries don't have these, ask for the species, ask for them in small stock. Bare root is I, my personal, personally, I feel it's not ideal because I feel like it's stressful for the trees, but try that that's why this strategy is really important and it works um for the treatment yeah so you went through a lot of treatments and i know some were available you could use something now and then there were some that were kind of not still in, yeah. in process so like if you want to do something today what would it be and then can you forecast to the future of like the availability maybe of yeah, so, some of the other treatments? So basically you first would want to hire a licensed tree expert to do this. Like if you're, you know, if I'm talking to the New Jersey people, that's the New Jersey license, you know, tree expert. So you, you want to have them apply it. The polyphosphate 30 is actually a fertilizer. So a landscape contractor could apply that too. And you can follow that mix on the, um, University of Rhode Island website that I mentioned earlier on by Heather, um, Heather Faubert. And that can be applied. 
Um, we just we just don't know how successful it is for larger beach. So it's almost like an experiment in your landscape. And another aspect is it is a phosphorus product. So if you're by water, what you know, don't be doing this right before a big rain event. And we don't want to be adding a lot of phosphorus into our system. You know, another aspect is um, that the broad form. So I didn't get to mention, but broad form is the is the product you can use on beach, but you can't use it for BLD yet. So your tree needs to have another disease, but it probably has another disease. So arborists throughout the state of New Jersey are using broad form, but broad form is really hard to get right now. And that's because of a another issue because there was a product hip hiccup, we'll just say, but it's an actually complicated scenario. Um, so your licensed tree expert may provide you, um, if he can get a hold of broad form, they'll recommend a broad form foliar spray um, and the polyphosphite 30. So that's what you could do in terms of treatment at this point. I'm very hopeful that by next year, we can use the thibendazole, which is sold as Arbitec 20S. And we won't, you know, we won't, it, it would be best to do this during the growing season next year so that now we have some time between then and now to get that approved in our state. And then we just don't know with KaidoCure. So KaidoCure is an organic product and, you know, you can uh, ask your licensure expert to test it out on your property and just understand that we also don't know what the impacts are on the landscape. They are organic. It's probably one of the safest products out of all the ones we mentioned, but it also dissolves chitin, which is a part of the exoskeleton. So you might hit insects that are beneficial at the same time. Um, so this is a question I would have. So as a consulting forester advising landowners with potentially, you know, 10 acres, 30 acres, 100 acres, and their beach have beach leaf disease, it's obvious. Um, I think in my mind, I've had this like, well, this is going to be like um, gypsy moth, and it's just going to hurt them. And, you know, is maybe the next year they'll leaf out and they'll be okay. But based on what you said, that's not how this is going to go. Yeah. You and know I mean, enough to say it's not going to happen like that's, that. That's okay. And that's what I'm, I'm just repeating what I've heard. And this comes yeah. out of what they're seeing since it came and has been coming across from Ohio since 2012. Right. So right. that's how we know the mortality rates from... Yeah. Ohio and Western New York, where all of this like evidence of the mortality, um, the speed of mortality is occurring. And so we haven't seen a lot of mass death, like for instance, with ash, that's what in New Jersey yet. But that's why this talk is so important, because that's what the researchers are telling us further west is going to happen. Okay. It's not something where these guys, our beach are just going to bounce back. Yeah. Okay. Because we, you know, we advise landowners and in particular, we may have landowners who are, you know, as part of a farmland assessment program, they are cutting trees for firewood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look out in the forest and you think when the ash were dying, you kind of felt like with positivity, like they're going to die like 98% or whatever. Yeah. Um, so at the beach, you're, you're, if that's the direction we're headed, is it safe to encourage landowners? Like, yeah, it's okay to begin to kind of call out some of the beach that I, seem infected. I think if it's, I think it's safe to say, if you wanted to be really conservative, if you've lost 50% of the canopy, it's likely it's going to go. Um, okay. Yeah. But the, I've also seen that if someone chooses to treat the trees, that even with like 60 to 70 percent of the, the um, leaf loss, they flushed out a new set of leaves. So the treatments do work. It just depends because you have to think about the long term. Are you going to do this every year? Are you going to be able to afford that every year? Right. And how large is your property? How many beach? So we could be talking like, a, you know hundreds to thousands of dollars per tree per year depending on which treatment strategy you want to go with but 
not to digress, that Arbitec may make treatments much more acceptable. Um, it's, I'm sorry, it's accessible, the thibendazole, because you're doing one treatment versus four to six. Mm -hmm. So that's that cost gets brought down and that might make it more accessible for landowners that can put some money towards conserving their beach. And we still don't know how like the the um, how long that will last. So there are people protecting ash and what it's like every other year they're doing an injection. So there's a cost, but it's not as hefty as some of our other options. Got it. So that's a little segue. Don, are you still there? I have a question for you. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Okay. Wake up. No, I'm kidding. Hey, so no, no. Uh, hey. Uh, we, we had a question earlier, and this would, you know, kind of applies to Beach too. Are there any programs within the NRCS on the treatment side to preserve ash trees? If somebody were preserving ash trees, obviously, most people are preserving one or two in their yard with injections. Mm -hmm. I do have one landowner who I work with who I think he does about 80 trees in the interior forest um, on a, you know, road every other year or whatever. So does the NRCS have any program for something like that? That's a good question. And um, the short answer is we don't really have um, any practices in the forestry realm to address the use of pesticides on trees. You know, the mitigation um, effort that I was talking about earlier was really designed as much of our as many of our programs are to kind of um, address a problem that's already in place and then how to move forward and get new trees established. That's the emphasis of that. And, you know, ironically, I, we do have probably some practices like IPM practices in farming. We haven't gotten, gotten that far in forestry yet in an RCS world. But when you think about NRCS's interface with forestry, they've only really been engaged in, in working with forestry practices, I'm going to say in the past 10, a little bit over 10 years. So um, it's evolving and it's something that maybe we have to kind of consider how to, to talk about, not to get into too much minutia, but, you know, our, our contracting is really like every government program is pretty onerous. So the idea that we can contract for a few trees is is really a challenge. You know, we, we're looking at things at scale. So the landowner you mentioned that does 80 trees, that might be something that we can find a way to, you know, find a practice that would work for that or develop a practice. We have the opportunity to do that. We can be, you know, but as of yet, we don't have any IPM or um, pesticide practices for trees. And certainly not at a small scale that I think is where most of this effort of treating trees in New Jersey probably would would fall. Like, I don't foresee all the great information Gene just gave. I don't know how practical that is at scale in a forest. You know, these are really, in, in my view, things that we can do to save more kind of urban and suburban trees. Um, I don't know how the cost just, you know, would be prohibitive and the effort might be prohibitive in a forest setting to try and do it at, at the scale of acres. And, and, you know, she said that I'm not saying anything different, but, you know, and that's really, you know, when you think of NRCS programs, it's, they're really set up for originally for those type of larger scale systems. Although we are trending with this emphasis on urban agriculture and urban concerns, to try and address smaller scale issues. So that's a very long-winded way of saying, no, I don't think so at this time, but hopefully we can, as this become bigger of an issue, maybe we can look to, to making it work. Got it. So, um, but the program that you mentioned that we kind of focused on ash trees uh, would, if you have a forest with more than 25% canopy represented by beach, that appear to have beech leaf disease, they could qualify for that program to begin doing the removal and the planting, right? Don? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. All right, yeah. And so especially that would work the way that, in a forest that setting. 
that beach grow colonial colonial uh, I'm having a hard time saying that you know in clones and and in dense clusters maybe I could say that um you know that would certainly fit with the emphasis of our program and we always have opportunities to even if it doesn't fit that 25 percent to help with planting and brush management for invasive control and other opportunities to you know kind of diversify the forest and get new regeneration started Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're about, it's 833. So we're kind of past our normal, normal break here. Um, any maybe closing thoughts, Gene, Don, any, anything else, something you missed, maybe you feel like you want to add? Uh, I, I shared so much, but I just <laughs> do want to say that wherever possible, wherever there's funding. And I think that even like, um, like artificial regeneration, which is a fancy way of saying, reforesting in the forest i think is our best bet wherever we can afford and put money towards that in forested areas that would probably be our best case scenario um, to try to mitigate any of these impacts especially around repairing corridors that we want to shade um, so i'll be hopefully working in with uh, morris county parks and doing some some pilot uh, mitigation plantings under beach to demonstrate that strategy even though it might not be for really large expanses, but it might be piecemeal here and there. What what can we do to speed up the regeneration? Because beach in general, their mechanism inhibits the growth of other plants. So it's going to be re like, who's going to come in first? Who's going to come in once we lose those beach on their own? It's probably mm -hmm. going to be invasive plants. Mm -hmm. So we need to make, we need to cover that ground with native uh, cohort trees as soon as we can. Great, Don, anything else? No, I mean, I would just add that um, the in, the point about it being in these riparian areas and kind of MESIC sites is relevant. That's one criteria we're using in our ranking for this, like who gets prioritized for funding. If you're within a riparian zone or within a wetland or a wetland transition area, you're going to get a higher uh, preferential consideration for funding. So that's definitely an important thing. I think that's been important with Emerald Dashboard and really been what has been a made that a crisis is that ash and now beach to a different degree have been concentrated in these MESIC sites along riparian areas that are you know, more prone to invasive, invasive species proliferation. So, you know, these are more important than some other areas that might naturally regenerate a little bit better. Um, so it is important to take proactive steps, I guess, is yeah. the take home message. And one, one last bit, um, we know that with um, a lot of our other epidemic diseases like chestnut, people went through and clear cut so quickly before they could even see if there were um, any resistant chestnuts, right? What we're finding is we haven't found any yet, but I don't want to, um, I think it's too soon to say to just go clear cut your beach. I just, I, I would say if we're going to be doing something underneath the canopies, let the beach die in their um in 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 the way that they're going to in the in the rate that they're going to die and let's not pro, like quickly cut them down because we still don't know and a lot the science is happening and the research is happening really fast i still have some hope <laughs> and i still have some hope that there could be some more resistant um varieties out there more resistant populations so let's just let's not go and cut them down too fast got it all right, Gene and Don, thank you for your time. Um, seriously, we appreciate it. It's a, it's a, you could be doing a million other things and I'm sure you get lots of requests to talk in other places. So we appreciate both of you taking time to, to talk to us. And uh, you had tons of compliments in the chat and then the Q and A oh, and uh, we are very grateful. And for everybody still on, I'm going to work hard to figure out a way to get an email out with uh, Don's info sheet and then Gene, could you make your presentation I make slides PDF. available? Yeah, okay. I'll, I can right. send you a PDF. And okay. I really think, and I really want that, my tree species list, people <laughs> use it. 
Use those Got trees. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll work on uh, we'll work on getting that stuff out too. Okay. So. Great. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. Oh wait, we have a raised hand. Hold on, we haven't done a raised hand yet. I don't know how to do this. Let's see. Uh, three I think we're getting claps. That's yeah. what we're claps? getting claps. Okay. Yeah, because it has like a little motion, like oh, okay, those are claps. Notches. Yeah, we'll go. Yeah. We'll go with claps. Yeah. All right. We, we got to get even... back on this, Andy. What's that? We got to get Lori back on this. Okay? Yeah, we do. We do. We do. You did a great job, Andy. <laughs> be, I I want to be able to do any better. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. We'll Bye. see y'all. Bye, Bye, -bye. Bye, everyone.